Well, let's get started. We have several committee members who probably will join us shortly. And uh, just for committee to know, uh, Lori will not be with us today. Uh, she, she is not. Today is Valentine's Day, and her husband's flower shop uh, requires all hands on deck. Oh. <laughs> she said, I will be very busy. <laughs> OK, so uh, let's on the record. Yes. OK, good. Well, uh, welcome. We have, um, some of us just had the opportunity to be part of a, a president of a press conference around suicide prevention efforts in the state of Vermont, and we are taking advantage here in the House Health Care Committee today to hear uh, additional, to hear testimony around issues of suicide and suicide prevention in Vermont, uh, an issue that is important in and of itself. It also interacts with uh, some of our statewide goals in terms of uh, one cares, we all count care organizations and large population <laughs> health changes, uh, as well as uh, initiatives in other parts of state government, which I'm sure we'll be hearing more about. So what I'd like to suggest is that we have about an hour uh, scheduled at this point. I think we have five different witnesses, at least according to the list that I have. Uh, I think it might be useful to hear from each of our witnesses and then open it up to questions from the committee so that uh, we get to hear from everyone. But I'm sure there are questions and comments from our committee members. Um, so with that, I'd welcome you to identify yourself. Uh, Representative Donahue and colleagues, thank you so much for taking the time today and the initiative, really, to set this up. And we need to have you identify yourself. With I will do that right now. Thank you. Um, I am Dr. Joellen Tarallo. I'm the executive director of the Center for Health and Learning, a 501c3 that is a state partner to many health initiatives in Vermont addressing priority health issues. We work with the Agency of Human Service, the Agency of Education. Uh, we work with the Agency of Transportation uh, and numerous departments in the state of Vermont to uh, bring capacity to projects that are well conceived and hopefully to identify uh, concrete outcome measures as we're doing with suicide prevention. Uh, the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center is a public-private partnership in partnership with the Agency of Human Services. We get a small allocation and uh, we do our work um, in partnership with many organizations on a collective impact model. Um, as you may know, we know now pretty clearly that it's almost impossible to build out a community uh, prevention initiative without multiple partners. And so virtually all the work we do is in partnership with other people. Uh, the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center was created after uh, the Center for Health and Learning was identified as the lead designated agency for two federal grants in Vermont on behalf of the Department of Mental Health. Um, at that time, we created the coalition, and the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center is composed of more than 70 organizations and individuals who support suicide prevention. Everything that we do at the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center is advised by the statewide coalition. Uh, and we, we carry out deliverables under contract from the Department of Mental Health that are conceived by the center as well as the coalition. Um, we also build out projects that are funded by foundations and rely on donors to help us build out um, the projects statewide. <coughs> so we, uh, about in 2015, the coalition was charged with developing a statewide guidance document for suicide prevention. I'm uh, sorry I don't have slides today because I have some beautiful slides, as my colleagues will attest. Um, but I will make sure and get some of those to you afterwards, if that's OK, Representative Lippert. Uh, so one of the things that we accomplished was bringing the coalition together to develop a guidance document called the Vermont Suicide Prevention Platform 2015, Suicide Prevention Across the Lifespan. Um, in that platform, we identified a range of um, objectives tied to a socio-ecological model, which we also understand that uh, people exist in and of themselves, but they exist in family systems, and those family systems exist in relationship to all sorts of community systems, as well as state government and policies. So when we build out a project, we're aiming at the individual in the center, but we're really uh, impacting the entire socio-ecological model. Um, the family systems and the systems with which they engage, in this case, healthcare. 
Um, we are also the developers of the You Matter Suicide Prevention Program, which was conceived by the coalition. The message behind You Matter is you matter because you may need help, and you matter because you may be in a position to help. So if you're reading that, you'll notice that I'm derivating quite, quite a bit um, extemporaneously, so please bear with me. Uh, right now and today, we're focused on health care and the issue of creating a competent, well-resourced approach to health care across a continuum of care, which includes health promotion, prevention, early intervention, that's the key, intervention, uh, targeted treatment, suicide safe pathways that include discussions about lethal means restriction when a person is in crisis, and that has people tooled all the way along the way with evidence-based practices for screening, assessment, treatment, timely referral, and response. Because as it turns out, timely referral and caring contact are, are timely referral is not a low-cost intervention. We all know the challenges of that in our, our decentralized health system. But creating partnerships and linkages that create timely referral is very important. And caring contact ongoing following somebody's suicidal crisis turns out to be the lowest cost, most important intervention there is, aside from making sure that they don't have access to lethal means at the times of time of crisis. But people have to identify when they go to the primary care doctor. They have to be able to identify in family medicine. When they get to the emergency room, and we have a partner, Dr. Um, Ike, who will uh, Ike Bloom, who will talk uh, in a moment about the challenges from an emergency system department and uh, medicine point of view. Um, we have to think about the system linkages, but we have to have people in all those places who are trained and ready to respond. About five years ago, it became clear in the national discourse that a large number of people seek help from health care and then go on to die of suicide. Um, if that was happening with cardiovascular disease, um, it would be evident and we would know that there were a certain set of procedures and evidence-based practices, screenings that had to happen, medicine if it's indicated, um, and a pathway to treatment that might include cardiac rehab in the physical therapies department of the local hospital. This is what we're looking for with suicidality. <clears throat> Treating suicidality as a condition in and of itself so that it can be identified, assessed, treated, and effectively reduced. The foundational belief of zero suicide is that suicide deaths for individuals under care within health and behavioral health systems are preventable. Zero suicide requires a system-wide approach to improve outcomes and close gaps. And this morning, we gathered healthcare leadership in a press conference to make an explicit commitment to reduce deaths to suicide through the healthcare system. And we have the all-payer outcome measures working in our favor in that regard. Um, this isn't rocket science. One only need to look at the data to know that we have a problem and that we have it within ourselves and our systems to impact that problem like we do in so many <coughs> other areas. Mel mental health providers cannot curb the tide on suicide alone. They can adopt evidence-based practices and share the responsibility between primary care, mental health services, emergency department crisis response, inpatient <coughs> units, and development of high-quality programming. I have had to learn about advocacy and how you can um, bring whatever leverage you have as a committee to bring more focus to the core values of zero suicide. We thank uh, Representative Donahue for mentoring us along this process and for a number of other legislators who have really taken up this issue over years. Uh, the Queechee Bridge mitigation is a success story that took five years um, and we've, we've implemented some evidence-based practices there. It has not been easy and we're yet to see the full outcomes of uh, bridge mitigation. We're making good strides in building infrastructure in state government but the field has tremendous needs for workforce development and technical assistance, data and surveillance that must be supported by healthcare. We stand by to support and help with capacity building, planning, implementation, and evaluation of such practices. 
and ask you to consider what levers of influence you have as legislators in health care committee to bring to bear on a rising crisis for which we do not want to be known in Vermont. Um, this is, I did insert um, a suicide prevention graphic which shows at the bottom of the pyramid universal strategies for suicide and then moving up more targeted, specific, and indicated strategies as we go along. We've identified the tools and the evidence-based practices in Vermont. Um, we have three pilot projects under a um, small amount of funding from Department of Mental Health that we've been learning from over the past three years, and they're just beginning. They were designated agencies, um, and they're just beginning to engage healthcare as well. Um, so I'm happy to ask quite, oh no, we're going to uh, turn it over to our next speaker. Very good. Um, I do want to mention that um, these are some of the Vermont suicide prevention programs that Department of Mental Health, Department of Health, Agency of Human Services um, has initiated and Vermont Suicide Prevention Center has provided support for. There are also resources for survivors of suicide loss on the www.vtspc.org website, um, which has a whole range of resources related to healthcare and su zero suicide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so go back here. And it looks like um, Dr. Lopez is next. All right. All right. So I'm all you do here if you want to this, which is very handy, is the on your name. Um, Whatever your preferences are for who, nice. who goes when. Hi, well, I'm Deborah Lopez Gottesman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, Welcome. I do have some paper copies. Does anyone want a paper copy of? I have yes. paper copies. Please pass around. And I also have some a reference paper that I thought would be useful for committee members. Great. Um, I'm here this morning um, because I'm a grieving mother. My son, Alan Gottesman, died by suicide just three years ago at the age of 25. Um, Alan died as, a, as an inpatient in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, he had left behind many who loved him, including his younger sister, my husband, who's here today, and myself. We're one of the hundreds of Vermont families who suffer the devastating impacts of suicide. But I'm not going to focus on that today um, because I'm all because of this is the health care committee. But thank you for sharing the yeah. personal part of your experience. Yeah. That's... I, I don't think it can be de-emphasized, you know, the, the impacts on our communities broadly. Um, but I have a different focus, which is that I'm also uh, ironically, a psychiatrist with over 30 years of patient care experience. I've also served as a clinical teacher in a variety of settings, including the UVM Medical Center, where I'm a cl clinical faculty member. <coughs> and I care deeply about my profession and the patients we're meant to serve. So I'm here really wearing those two hats. And um, time, uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about my son's situation, but I also want to say that he wasn't unique, so I really think it's important to emphasize that it, I'll tell an individual story, but his story, I think, just reveals problems that other people face, too. Um, so just briefly about Alan, he was a jazz music musician and especially sweet young man. At the time of his death, he was suffering from an episode of severe depression uh, that was related to a chronic, chronic pain problem <coughs> that, in his hands, actually, that made it hard for him to work and play music. And um, anyway, he became hopeless about his future. And so that's a sketch of what, what the background was that led to him becoming suicidal. But what, what I think is most pertinent about our story is that when he became suicidal, he sought help, unlike many who die by suicide who don't access the healthcare system. Um, 
he sought help from many well-regarded healthcare professionals, or, or a handful anyway, and he disclosed his suicidal thinking to his treatment providers from the very beginning. So um, no one needed to screen him. He made it very obvious that he was looking for help and what he was struggling with. I'm here to talk about that our son's death was the direct result of healthcare system failures, and I'm going to mention a few of those. Um, and it's the main point I want to make. Um, what we learned after Alan died, when we reviewed every word of his medical records, was that although his providers were well-intentioned, they were either completely untrained, and I mean completely, I can give you examples, or severely out of date in their training related to the treatment of a suicidal patient. Um, I'm going to repeat, this is the main point that I hope the committee will keep in mind. Uh, <clears throat> at every level of care in which our son sought help for his suicidality, with our support, um, from his primary care doctor to his private psychotherapist, well-regarded person, to his UVM Medical Center outpatient psychiatrist, who should be well-trained, to his in, the inpatient unit where he was at Central Vermont Medical Center, to the out-of-state tertiary care hospital where he was referred. <coughs> So, you know, <laughs> the providers were either completely untrained or surprisingly out of date in their uh, training and practices in terms of how to evaluate and treat a suicidal patient. I realize that what I'm saying may be hard for, for you to believe. It certainly was hard for us to believe. Um, you might imagine that our son was especially difficult to evaluate or complicated to treat. These assumptions would be incorrect. Um, I won't go into details, but the main point I'm trying to make here is that really the, the practices where he sought care lacked protocols and comp real competency in treating suicidal individuals. And this is, um, I provided a published paper to you that's actually a really good summary of um, a set of practice improvements that's being recommended that Joella Tarallo mentioned called the Zero Suicide Initiative, which describes the problem we found also. Um, the zero suicide approach has been shown to reduce suicide deaths in several healthcare systems nationally. The problem in Vermont is that not one of our health systems has fully adopted the su zero suicide approach or model. And very few psychiatrists or therapists are trained in how to provide evidence-based treatments. So I'm really emphasizing training problems as a major issue. I'm not going to go into <laughs> how this would, would this kind of situation would not be tolerated if, if it were another health condition. I could give an example, but I, I'll just move forward to say that um, much work is needed, obviously. And the, there are three main items that are also highlighted in this paper I distributed. First, healthcare leaders should prioritize improved care for suicidal patients. It's got to come from leadership. Training protocols and practice guidelines are two issues that are often absent in practices. Um, and quality assurance professionals are needed desperately to make sure that providers adhere to protocols. Um, I hope you'll, 
just my ask to the committee is that I hope that uh, you'll continue to educate yourselves about the deficits in the healthcare system related to suicide care and how our systems can be improved. Perhaps in the next year or so, we will be able to make some more specific suggestions um, as to how you as legislative leaders um, can help those of us who are working in the healthcare sector uh, to partner on perhaps initiatives related to training or other program problems. Um, and then questions are for later. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Eike Blom. I am an emergency medicine physician as well as a medical toxicologist and I practice at UVM Medical Center right now. I am one of the not competent, not trained physicians you've just heard about. And that is not an easy thing for a physician to say. I was trained at one of the best medical schools in the country at Johns Hopkins. I was trained at one of the best residencies in the country at the University of Massachusetts. And I have received virtually no training in how to care for patients with suicidality or severe mental illness. So I'm sitting in front of you today as an emergency medicine physician, not as a patient advocate, not as a psychiatrist, but as somebody who sees the extent of suffering of mental illness in the emergency department on a daily basis. To help you appreciate what a patient with mental illness goes through when they present to the emergency department, I want to run a little thought experiment with you. I want you to, to imagine that after today, you walk out of this building, you slip on some ice, and you fall and break your leg. You get taken to the hospital and I see you and we examine your leg together and it hurts. We'll take some x-rays and I confirm that yes, your leg is in fact broken. And in fact, it's broken in a way that I think you need to be admitted to the hospital and you may require surgery from an orthopedic surgeon. And then I tell you that the orthopedic surgeon will probably see you in maybe three days, maybe five, and I'll leave the room. And I'll leave you in a room with no windows, no fresh air. If you're lucky, the TV works. Um, the nurse comes by to see if there's anything you need, maybe a turkey sandwich, and tells you the story of a patient who broke their leg kind of just like you and waited in the emergency department for an entire month to be seen by an orthopedic surgeon. We leave you in that room with really no treatment. Don't give you pain medication. We don't, don't really reduce the fracture. We just leave you there for five days until the orthopedic surgeon sees you. You might be a little upset with your care because you did not receive it. You were essentially in prison for five days with no treatment. And f it strikes us as absurd when we would do this to somebody with a broken leg or with a heart attack or a stroke. <coughs> if for some reason that right now is the standard of care for people who come to us to seek help for their mental illness or their suicidal ideation. And, and over my career, I've heard a bunch of explanations of why that is okay. One of the explanations I hear is, well, these people, they're not really dying like somebody with a heart attack. Their, their life is not in acute danger, but I would argue, yes, it is, because their mental illness, their mental illness, their suicidality, has risen to the level where it overcomes their, their intrinsic instinct of self-preservation. And they may not be acutely dying in front of us right now, but after we've put them in a room with no treatment for five days or even a month, the next time they feel like that, they may not be willing to voice that. They may not be coming back to us. And I've also heard that, well, they're just depressed, they're not really in pain, they don't, they don't need pain making any treatment acutely. But I want you to remember, and this is maybe my Valentine's Day pitch, when you fall in love, you feel butterflies in your stomach, right? You have physical symptoms from an emotional state. And depression does the same thing, suicidality does the same thing. In fact, it creates real somatic pain. But we leave you untreated, sitting in that pain, in that room. 
so the question is, how, how do we fix this? And it's, it's, it's both an upstream problem and it's a downstream problem. There's not enough resources available to people with mental illness in our community. People can't access respite. They can't see their therapist in a reasonable amount of time. There's not enough therapists to go around. Mental um, health is not well funded. It's not well reimbursed. There's insurance issues. And once you come to my emergency department, and I make sure that well, you don't have a medical emergency, but then not much more, then there's a downstream problem. Because if you do need to be admitted, if you do need psychiatric hospitalization, there's simply not enough beds to go around. And if it's not safe to send you home because your depression rendered you not functional or your suicidal ideation is so severe that you think you're not safe by yourself at all, you have no choice but to wait for this. So there's the downstream problem. And it sounds like <coughs> something where you could just throw some money at it and fix it. But I also realize that money is hard to come by. So I want to kind of do a little bit of a cost analysis of what we do right now. The Center for, Medi uh, for Medicare Services in 2005 issued a report of how much it costs to hospitalize a mental health patient for one day. And that dollar number comes down to about $600. Half of that is for overhead of the psychiatric hospital. The other half is for direct patient care. Contrast those $600 per day to what an emergency medicine bed costs. Um, in the ED, a bed costs about $120 per hour to run. And my example of three to five days is not an exaggeration. In fact, it's the average. And average means half of the people wait longer. If you have a patient in a bed that costs $120 per hour, after five days, that has cost the same amount of money as providing psychiatric hospitalization for three weeks. So the question is, are we spending our money wisely? And it does have an impact on other people. Everybody who comes to the emergency department is impacted by this. We have a finite amount of rooms. We have a finite amount of resources. Right now, my emergency department dedicates approximately 25% of our resources to <coughs> patients with mental illness. And they deserve those resources. They're just not the resources that help them. But as a result, we have, just last week, ran a trauma in the hallway. Somebody who got hit by a car and had internal bleeding, I treated in a hallway. Two days ago, we had a cardiac arrest in the waiting room because they had waited for so long that they went to cardiac arrest. And this is the situation we're facing on the ground right now in the emergency department. So I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you about this. And like all the other speakers, we'll be available for questions after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. My name is Molly Dugan, and I'm the director of the statewide SASH program. Is that working? Oh. I did provide paper copies, if that works. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, so I'm, uh, again, my name is Molly Dugan. I'm the director of the statewide SASH program, which stands for Support and Services at Home. Um, Cathedral Square, my employer, is responsible for the statewide administration of this program, which is primarily funded by federal Medicare dollars um, by way of the all-payer model. Um, SASH has been in existence since 2011, and it is operated by the network of affordable housing organizations around the state. Um, I, would, I would venture to say pretty confidently that in each of your communities there is a SASH operated housing site. And if not in your community, stones throw away. Um, and this includes all the public housing authorities in the state as well operate SASH. Um, and what we do in the SASH program is we embed a care coordinator, um, who we also often refer to as a community health worker, and a wellness nurse, RN, in the affordable housing um, 
communities to provide person-centered um, direct support as well as care coordination to help um, our uh, clientele, primarily older adults and adults with disabilities, to stay at home as their um, needs change. Uh, we do this in full partnership with the existing community organizations um, in the area. That includes area agencies on aging, the Home Health Network, um, as well as community mental health agencies. Um, and we serve approximately 5,000 participants across the state. I'm here today to underscore the severity of suicide among the primary population that we serve in the SASH model, and that is older adults. And I want to explain, not so underscore the, the issues around suicide in older adults, and then I also want to explain how we're using this statewide SASH platform that you all as a legislature have funded for many years now um, to improve the access to help for our participants. Um, so some of the facts around suicide in older adults, I did include for you guys just a really short PowerPoint on some of these facts. I'm not going to go through this, but I did want to just highlight a few of them. Um, because basically what we know is that the suicide rate among older adults generally across the country is high. Um, and in Vermont in particular, the suicide death rates for older adults are in some cases alarmingly higher than the U.S. rate. And if you look on um, actually that first page, the first bar chart, you will see um, the rates of, um, of the older adult rates across um, Vermont. I mean. Vermont versus the U.S. Do we, um, we have hard copies for people who want hard copies? Yes. Yes, I grabbed those off. It's already distributed. It's already, yes. I apologize. Um, just a short PowerPoint. Um, I was sent an email. Okay, I'm and, sorry. It was distributed already. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, and it's uh, males in particular in the ages of between 70 and 74 that actually have the highest suicide death rate in our state. Um, and then the other... Um, I consider alarming statistic around older adults in our state, and so you'll see it on page two on the pie chart, and that is that older adult, adults have a much higher suicide completion rate than other ages. Um, and you know some of the reasons that are speculated for this have to um, to do with the fact that um, older adults use firearms um, usually, and that's very effective, unfortunately, means as well as um, older adults tend to live alone. And so if they have um, tried uh, uh, suicide, they may not be found for a while and get the help that they need. So those are just some of the, um, some of the context around suicide and older adults I wanted to share. Um, so what are we doing within the SASH platform of the program across the state? Um, so using the SASH program that's available, as I said, across the state, we are, uh, doing our very best to provide timely support, referral, and prevention programs to the 5,000 plus participants that we serve. So how exactly are we doing this? How are we doing this in your communities where you have SASH? So we're available at, uh, our program is available at about 140 different housing sites across the state. And this includes, you know, six unit apartments up in the Northeast Kingdom to the 100 unit um, high rises, the only high rises we really have in Vermont and Barrie and um, Burlington. So it doesn't matter the size or scale of the housing for um, low income older adults, you can pretty much bet there's a SASH support structure there. Um, so sprinkled across the state. And what we're doing is we're making sure that our workforce, our SASH staff, the coordinators, the wellness nurses, have training in the evidence-based um, suicide prevention and mental health trainings that are out there. And these include programs, and you've probably heard of some of these, mental health first aid, You Matter suicide prevention, gatekeeper training, as well as wellness recovery action planning, or known as RAP. So we're using our train, our staff across the state, no matter where they are, to be trained in these um, really important um, programs. Um, additionally, our SASH participants are assessed annually by our wellness nurses, at least annually, on a whole host of things, but it also includes, our assessments include validated screens for depression, anxiety, social isolation, loneliness, and importantly, suicide risk. <coughs> suicide risk in and of itself is a thing. So you can't just 
uh, sir, uh, assess someone for depression and think you're at a catch suicide risk. We learned that, we made a change, and we, we assess across the board for suicide risk now. Um, we also have built, through the SASH model across the state, a strong, strong and trusting relationships with our participants. That is the most important thing that we can do, because that's how we get our participants to open up to our staff to talk about these really difficult and sensitive topics. That is the first line of the job description for SASH coordinators, is that they build relationships with their participants. Um, we, our staff, provide regular check-ins daily, weekly basis with high-risk participants. They host support groups, educational events to combat the stigma around mental health and suicide, and um, we, they help our participants seek the mental health support they need. Um, I meant to do a little show and tell with you, but I forgot the yellow folder. So imagine that I'm holding a bright yellow folder, and we provide to all of our SASH programs across the state a suicide prevention resource packet. And if I open the folder, on the left-hand side is all the local emergency numbers for our staff to be able to call if they're working with a participant that is showing suicidal ideation. Um, it also has language to use and a script to ask those difficult questions, so it's right at their fingertips. On the right-hand side is information about national hotlines and a whole host of different resources for them. So we make sure this is an updated resource packet for our staff and that it's bright yellow so they can get to it really quickly in their offices. Um, and then we also have, through our SASH infrastructure across the state, we have a really strong partnership with those folks that are here today, the Center for Health and Learning, um, DALE, the Area Agencies on Aging, and the Designated Community Mental Health Agencies. We're really working strongly in collaboration to, to, to provide that, um, the support that really fills in the gaps for our participants. Um, and I, I want to, lastly, the, the, I can't underscore enough the, the prevention that we're able to do through the SASH program. Our housing sites across the state, a lot of them have community space on the first floor or you know, somewhere within their buildings, and we're able to use that community space for these suicide prevention types of programs. Um, and I want to just, in collaboration with um, Dale, I want to just make the point that the need for suicide prevention is also now highlighted in the new state plan on aging and that work is underway by Dale to train more and more of the community service providers across the state um, in uh, this basic prevention. So in closing, I just want to um, state that the SASH program is committed to being part of the solution to preventing suicide death, deaths in our state. Um, we want to continue to collaborate fully and closely with our existing partners and look for new ones to partner with. Um, to get to the ultimate and realistic goal of zero suicide in our state. Um, and I just want to um, make one final plug, and that is that um, that is for the continued administrative funding for SASH in the 2020 state budget. Unfortunately, in the governor's proposed budget for 2020, there's a, a cut to our administrative infrastructure funding that comes through Dale to the tune of 50%. Um, that kind of cut is gonna be devastating to the work like this that we do to have a statewide system to deploy the workforce and to meet with your constituents where they live. Um, so I'll end on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. I'd like to add to what she just said. Uh, uh, we've had SASH up in, in the Northeast Kingdom for a while, and they, they go above and beyond strictly suicide prevention and assist seniors to maintain their living ability in their own homes. And uh, that, I want to thank you for that. Right. That's pretty cool. We're going to hear from Tom Stellini, <coughs> and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, I have hard copies, people like. Uh, my name is Tom Delaney. I'm on the faculty in the Department of Pediatrics and also in the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program at the University of Vermont, the Martyr College of Medicine. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the data and trends that some of some of them already been hinted at, but it's um, often quite powerful, I think, to, to actually look at the data. It can be very instructive. Uh, this is a graph 
I'm going to ask you to bear with me a little bit on this. Um, it shows trends, and these are trends in suicide death rates. So the top line, the blue line, is Vermont death rates, and below that is U.S. death rates. We use rates because it accounts for the fact that Vermont has a small and more variable estimate. Um, we can compare apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. So a couple of things I'd like you to notice about this graph. One is that the blue line is consistently higher than the green line. So the Vermont's going all the way back to 2005 and before 2005. Vermont's rates are substantially higher than the US rates. Another thing I'd like you to notice is that if you look back to 2005, um, Vermont is about one and a half people worse in our rate than the US. And you fast forward to 2017, and we're more than double that amount worse than the US. So we are um, accelerating. We're actually getting worse faster than the US death rates. I'll make a plug at this point that um, we're, our estimates are a little bit jagged. You can see that. And that's because we just don't have that big a population. If we had a larger population, the line would be smooth. Um, I also want you to think a little bit about that. We're, we're talking about 110 plus or minus deaths a year, which is huge and which impacts thousands of families, as Dr. Lopez said. Um, think about e the attempts to, so I'll show you data in a minute that says that, especially among younger people, there's probably 25 attempt survivors for every death. So think about that. Think about the hospitalizations, think about the people who wind up in the ED, um, many perhaps unnecessarily and, and preventably. Um, Molly mentioned some of the um, differences that we see in death rates for older Vermonters and um, older people in the US. I'd like you to look at the, the left part of this graph, and this is the death rates for broad age bands. Yep, sorry. OK. Um, so these are broad age bands, and the dark blue lines are for males, and the green bars are for females. And what you see is that males are consistently three or four times higher in their death rates than females are, and that's consistent with the US. Um, I would point out that you know all these bars pretty much are higher on the left than the ones on the right. So we're not talking about Vermont's just worse among older people. It's across the, the board worse. The last thing I would point out about this graph is that um, females, if, if females are making it to their mid-60s, they're actually doing fairly well. We really see that males are, are really driving this. And then to really unpack that, what's happening in the older population, and Molly, Molly mentioned this as well. She showed the exact same graph, actually. Um, I will just point out that, as she noted, it is men in their 60s and early 70s that seem to be driving most of the disparity between Vermont's higher rates and the national rates. Um, one thing we've been looking at recently is trying to get finer grained and understanding where suicide deaths are happening, also attempts, but this graph focuses on deaths. This is the 14 Vermont counties broken out by their death rates over a three-year period, um, going back 2012 to 14. We use a three-year period because there aren't that many deaths in some of the smaller counties, so we lump the years together. But look at this variability. We see Lamoille County is running four times higher in their death rates than Grand Isle County. Um, it's, it's remarkable to me. When we started looking at the county-level data, it was shocking to see what kind of uh, disparities we were seeing. Now, if we looked at a different three-year period, we might get a different pattern. But we do see that, you know, on average, uh, there are huge disparities in where people are dying. I suspect if we looked at suicide attempts, we'd probably get a similar picture. We just haven't done that yet. Could you um, do that at some point? I'd love to do that. Yeah. Um, the attempts data is harder to get because you have to get it from EDs or right. inpatient hospitalizations. Um, I did want to make a point uh, that's already been made. Molly made this point. The majority of uh, suicide deaths in Vermont are um, involving firearms. Um, followed by suffocation, poisoning, and falls, and other means. Uh, when we look at younger people, so, so the firearms deaths are mostly being driven by older people, um, specifically older males who tend to be more likely to, to own firearms. Um, and, and I think this point is worth making. Firearms injuries are, are much less reversible than intentional overdoses and suffocation. Um, they're instant and they're more, they're more traumatic. So um, you, could, you could look at this graph and think about why, why the lethality is so much higher for firearms. There's a, a lot of reasons why that would be the case. Um, and then among younger people, we also see that among teenagers, basically, there seems to be a, a bit higher use of firearms, um, and less so in the 
sort of middle age ranges. I wanted to um, drill down on youth just a little bit, very briefly. Um, CDC estimates that there's 25 suicide attempts among younger people for every death that you get from suicide in younger people. And as Molly noted, um, this goes to four attempts for every death among younger people, and there's a bunch of reasons why that would be the case. Um, a recent estimate that we came up with was that if you look at medically serious um, suicide attempts, so this isn't mediation or cutting or, or um, things that might not necessarily get you to the emergency room, but we are looking at a minimum of 375 annually just among young people. Um, and that's out of a total of over 1,500 people annually who would wind up having medically serious uh, suicide attempts. Young people seem to be overrepresented among um, suicide attempts. And I did want to make um, a mention of some of the higher risk populations. So uh, we, we love the Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey. It's a wonderful window into what young people are thinking, what their behaviors are. But we have really great participation in Vermont, which I'm very thankful for. Um, from the 2017 YRBS, we learned that LGBTQ young people are about three times more likely to have felt sad or hopeless every day for at least two weeks. That's a marker. It's one of the diagnostic criteria for a major depressive episode. Um, that's pretty significant. LGBTQ young people are four times more likely to have hurt themselves on purpose in the past 12 months. That could be cutting, piercing, scratching. And they're more than four times more likely to have made a suicide plan in the past year and four and a half times more likely to have actually made a suicide attempt. So this is where we're talking getting up in 30, 40, 50% range among this population for, uh, for serious suicidal behavior. Um, students who identify as being people of color are 50% more likely to have made a suicide plan in the preceding 12 months, and more than 50% increased likelihood to have actually made an attempt. This is in contrast with the national data, where nationally, um, being a member of a racial or ethnic minority is actually protective against suicide. In Vermont, it, it appears not to be the case among young people. Again, to emphasize what you're saying, this is Vermont data. This is Vermont. Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Data. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention another YRBS data point. Um, we have these trends going from 2011 to 2017. The blue line is felt sad or hopeless for two or more weeks. Green line is purposefully hurt self. Um, the dark green has made a suicide plan in the past year, and the red line has attempted suicide in the past year. Um, Vermont seems to have hit its high water mark on these bad measures in uh, 2015, and there may be a slight change happening according to 2017, except for that felt sad or hopeless. Seems like it's still trending in the wrong direction. Um, and the one line I would orient you towards on this graph is the top blue line. That is um, Vermonters age 20 to 24 who actually died by suicide. Um, and again, using bins of years, so three year bins of years. This trend has been increasing since about 2006 through 2017. Uh, we're consistently higher than the US rates, which are the green, green bars. Um, and the US, it's not so much that Vermont's trend is getting better, it's that the US is catching up to us. Okay? So relative to the US, we don't look as bad, but really we are pretty much just as bad as we were. And that's for ages 20 to 24. The dark green line with the squares below is uh, Vermont ages 10 to 19, also higher than the US. I wanted just to make a few um, takeaway points about this, this brief overview. Um, we know that US suicide death rates have increased. There's been a lot of media in the past year about that. I think there's been less focus in our state on the fact that Vermont suicide death rates have been increasing differentially faster. Um, it definitely feels to me like it's a public health crisis, mental health crisis. Most suicide deaths occur among middle-aged and older Vermonters, and especially among males. Firearms are the most frequently used means that Vermonters use to take their lives. And lastly, that specific groups of younger people, including LGBTQ people and people of color, Young people of color show substantially higher rates of suicide deviation than attempts. Um, I think, do we transition to questions now? Or, yeah? I'm happy to start answering or switch off. I can do that. And uh, I just would suggest that we have everyone who was speaking available to respond to questions from where you are or if there's empty chairs near the microphone's off. Let's start with some questions. Uh, Mark. Hi, I'm Mari Cordes. I represent Lincoln, Moncton, Bristol, and Starksboro. I'm also a registered nurse. I've worked in inpatient psychiatry 
currently working at UVM Medical Center, where we are seeing the fruits of your work um, in screening for suicidality. Um, and I'm noticing an opportunity for growth as a healthcare professional among myself and um, my uh, colleague, my nurse colleagues. Um, and again, I've had experience in inpatient psychiatry. I'm also a survivor. I've had four immediate family members commit suicide. So I take this very seriously. In the inpatient admission process, um, recently we now uh, started using a screening tool where we ask people what, you know, all sorts of questions like what sort of um, faith you are and you want to have someone come visit you. We ask if you have advanced directives. We ask what clothing you brought. Um, and then now we're asking using a tool, and I don't know, actually I'd be interested um, to know. PQH2. PQH2 is the, PHQ. the name of the tool? It's PHQ9 and PHQ2. Somebody translate for those who are not in your world. Patient so, health questionnaire, nine question version, and two question version. So that, that has been very interesting. interesting. I can see how it would be helpful. What I'm noticing in my colleagues is the stigma around asking patients that um, were hesitant to ask those questions and I think it's a great opportunity for myself as a everything that I just described um, to help myself and to help my colleagues also um, use it as a uh, time to teach patients and their family around the issue and to be sure not to brush those questions off because they might make us feel uncomfortable or we think that it's going to make the patient or the family feel more uncomfortable. So I appreciate the work that you've done. Um, and the last thing is I also appreciate, before you got to the slide about the LGBTQ, um, when you were looking at gender um, statistics, I was wishing that um, gender nonconforming was in that um, collection of, of data and so going forward it would be helpful to um, to have that in I would encourage the state to collect it because I'd love, I'd love to analyze it and we have it for YRBS the state's great for YRBS but there may be other places where it could be better. I, in fact, I think there is some effort in that direction but I'd like to confirm what I think I know um, Emery? Um, well, I have a couple of questions, but uh, the doctor's not talking, this is Mari saying that people feel they don't really ask about suicide and stuff. But, and it was mentioned that doctors need more training, but they also, doctors don't seem to talk about death at all. You know, even if you have a cancer diagnosis, they're hesitant to say you've got two to three months left. They usually say we have another treatment and they try to give hope. Where do you suggest that training begins? Because that's not just, it's a cultural shift. It's not just, oh, let's go to this training and you'll have it. We we just wrote a grant last year to start some training programs for residents who are, are in the primary care departments and suicide assessment of patients, which gives them practice in asking those difficult questions. There also, there, there's a good amount of funding that just, this is UVM Medical Center, and it should be at other places too, but I know UVM just started a palliative care program, which is making, moving the ball forward a little bit in training doctors on how to talk to patients about death and dying and end of life questions and those sorts of things. So training isn't easy, it takes, um, and it takes leadership. Someone has to decide that the training is necessary and then negotiate with training directors <laughs> to say, can you fit, could you please fit this into your curriculum? And some training directors are not so open to, but they also have full curriculum. So it's, it's not an easy situation, but it takes the committed people, basically, I think. If I may answer. Yes. Um, I think it's a system. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, a systems management issue. Uh, you know, zero suicide has three central facets. A set of core values about shared responsibility, uh, and also a commitment to parity in physical and mental health. Uh, but the second realm or facet is systems management. And that's all about training, workforce development. And we have very good tools, a workforce development survey for zero suicide that assesses all of a clinician's uh, or healthcare practitioner's knowledge and skills across a spectrum of services. And then we can identify what the priorities are for training. And then the third um, element is, well, what are we going to train them in? And that's evidence-based practices. So the core values, the systems management, and the evidence-based practices are, are really quite laid out in the zero suicide framework. Um, my hope is that we would begin to see this kind of training in all healthcare training. Um, and I, I do want to mention, because it concerns me, that we sometimes ask clinicians to use these assessments before they've had any time to deal with their own attitudes and stigmas and values. And that's called gatekeeper training. And if you notice on the sheet you've got the bottom of the pyramid includes universal for everybody training. And that's for the public, for community members, for healthcare on talking about these issues. And that's what we call You Matter is a Gatekeeper Training. And there are others as well. And I, and I feel strongly about that because we're, we're giving practitioners the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale or the Collaborative Assessment for the Management of Suicide and asking them to implement these with patients without even giving them an hour or an hour and a half to just confront societal ads, uh, attitudes and norms, et cetera. Very helpful. So I'm going to suggest that we initially just for committee members or people who are looking at the agenda, plan to take a break about in a minute or two. But uh, given where we are, I think I would like to suggest that we continue with questions for another 10 minutes plus, maybe 15 minutes, because I think that's a very rich opportunity. Then we'll take a break, a shorter break, and then we'll hear from our other witnesses. So I think, uh, and some of this will weave together as we hear from the other witnesses in late morning. But that's, if that's agreeable with committee members, and if you're available for us to continue to ask, for those who are available, continue to ask questions. Lucy. I have a question for Dr. Um, <clears throat> I've seen the, the suicide death rates by county statistics a few times. I represent, I'm Lucy Rogers, I represent Waterville and Cambridge, so two towns of Memorial County, um, which has, in, the has the highest in the, in the statistics I've seen. I guess my questions for this would be, first, if there's any thought on why suicide rates would vary by county. But then secondly, and I'm assuming these numbers are per 100,000 individuals, yeah, which means big. we're talking two to three deaths per year in Loyal County, and the difference between two deaths or three deaths being the difference between us being in the middle versus the top. Yeah. And so I guess I'm curious as to how much we can take away from that, these numbers. Is it something, and, and has, it, has it been looked at over different year ranges? Because if it really is the, just the difference of like it varies in some years, different counties are on top and it's less, you know, I'm yeah. very thought about so that, the, so I'm curious what you're thinking. Yeah, so your second question is great, and that's about fluctuation and it's small. You know, we're extrapolating based on small populations, and to the extent that we're doing that, we are definitely having more bouncing around the estimates. So we try to use multiple years mm -hmm. estimates, and then we do also revisit and look at different years. I can tell you the oil is consistently one of the worst, though. It's, it's, we haven't really seen that bouncing around towards the middle and that. And are there any thoughts as to why? Well, this is a good point for me to point out. This is when I should say that I'm representing my own views and not the views of University of Vermont. Um, okay? So I should have said that earlier. Um, uh, demographics has a lot to do with it. So there are populations in the US that are inherently higher suicide death rates. Um, so rural, rural areas are higher for death rates, also higher for firearms ownership and social isolation and things like that. Uh, Vermont has really high rates of binge drinking. Binge drinking is correlated with um, higher suicide death rates. Um, Vermont, that, I would suspect that your, your county is one of the whitest counties. And actually, the demographic data is that um, more white population areas actually have higher suicide death rates than areas that have more racial and ethnic minorities. 
Um, rates of firearm ownership is a correlate. I already mentioned that. So there's a whole cluster of things, and it's it's probably important to note that it's you you can't look at one person who dies by suicide and extrapolate about all the different systems and ways that they were either helped or not helped. But um, everybody's unique, right? So it's hard to say what's what's impacting people in the wild differently than the rest of the state. And I wish that we had a, a clearer story. And all these things are correlated with it, but it's not like A causes B causes C. Thank you. Uh, I think Brian spent the night. Anyone could answer this question for me. <clears throat> Firearms take a really bad rap all the time, no matter what is being talked about nowadays. Uh, do you? Or anyone, I'd like all of your opinions as far as this goes, but do you think that if death by suicide, uh, the firearm was not available, would the person that took their own life find an alternative way to do it? So you, I mean, yeah, would they insist on yeah, getting yeah. it done, so to speak? So I can answer this from two different perspectives. One's from the emergency medicine point of view, and one is from a uh, medical toxicologist uh, point of view. Um, a lot of people who attempt suicide do this impulsively. They often require some degree of intoxication to overcome the inner hurdle and then uh, execute their plan, whatever it is. There are a couple of things that if you change your mind later, you can't reverse it. And those are firearm injuries and jumping of heights. If you're mid-fall, you can't change your mind. Anymore. Once you pull the trigger, you cannot change your mind. If, however, you overdose, for example, you can realize 10 minutes later, oh my god, what I did was incredibly stupid, or desperate, or not well thought out, and go seek help. With a firearm, you don't have that option. Um, after you have poisoned yourself, most poisonings are sublethal. Most people will do fine even without treatments, and people who do need treatments, most poisonings are treatable. There's very few that we can't treat. The gunshot wound, once you pull the trigger, it's there. Um, the same goes for hanging. Most people that try to hang themselves, they don't hang themselves, and they use the term carefully, correctly, um, where they would have immediate death. Most people actually suffocate to death or strangulate. And in that time, sometimes they realize, this is not working, this is, this is not what I want to do, and they get back on their feet. Or they struggle loud enough for someone to get help and cut them down in time, once you hear a gunshot, it's not the person. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's hard to hear, but helpful to hear. I, Wait, I think there's more to that. I'm, I'm sorry, I, um, and I'm not one of the speakers. Do you please. want to speak to this, Deborah? Go ahead. It's my husband. Our husband. I'm a family doctor. <laughs> there's a threshold effect. And we're, there are, when people get to a certain point of extreme where they're ready to pull the trigger, it's because they've crossed the line, but they don't. But there's a lot of research to show they don't stay across the line. And so the fact that what you asked, would they kill themselves anyway? And the answer is generally thought to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, no, they wouldn't. That's right. There's a lot of research showing this with veterans, uh, with a number of groups um, that really even just putting a barrier between you, and, like a lock between you and access to the gun, can make a difference in someone's life. And like you said, uh, handgun. Pretty, pretty permanent. Yeah. Or yeah. whatever firearm, I should say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you. Just one, one thing I would add is I meant to, when I was describing the yellow folders we give out to all of our staff across the state, one thing I forgot to mention is we include gun locks on the right hand side as well, and those are provided by the um, mental health agencies. And we're, what we have found is that our SASH staff are able to have such close relationships with their participants that they can have that conversation to say, you know, we just talked about the suicidal idea ideation. I care about you. I'm worried about you. Can we use this gun lock and put this on? I, I know you have a gun because you've told me that in the past. Can we do that? And, you know, in some instances they're able to do that. But it's all about the relationship and having that gun lock. <laughs> and so. about the practitioner, if I may add, Molly, because um, you're, you're really on an important tack here. The practitioner having the training to know yes. that this is what's called collaborative safety planning. Yes. That they need to have the conversations with the patient and the people in the environment to remove the lethal means. Yes. 
and so, do it together. And it does take relationship, and it takes asking the question, knowing what you're asking, and how to have that conversation. So, <coughs> did you have a question? Yeah. And then David, and then I'd like to weigh in on a couple questions as well. Um, I think I think my question is mostly directed to. Um, I have to check check your name. Sorry, to. Joelle and Tarallo, okay. because it's it's about training. But um, so I'm Brian Chena. I'm from I, I represent Burlington, and uh, I'm actually a psychotherapist and I'm a substitute crisis clinician. Um, Thank you. Thanks. And uh, and the question I had, I'm just looking for this chart. So you know, I've had tra they train it just for not that I'm a witness right now, but just so people know, they do train crisis clinicians, at least at the Howard Center, in CALM. Um, and you say what that is? Just that's brief. the counseling to access, I might butcher the name a little bit, counseling, counseling ask. Counseling about lethal means. Oh, I thought exactly. it was, I thought it was uh, yeah, I thought it was counseling about access to lethal means, but, but basically they, they train clinicians in how to talk with people, how to be skillful about asking about access to weapons during any kind of assessment and how to like, Work with people and their families and support systems to like reduce access to those what to lethal weapons. Um, anyway, I have training in that, and I have training as a psychotherapist in CBD at CBT. And that was a Freudian slip yesterday. Yesterday, 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 yesterday they had the cannabis sphere here. So, um, so I have training in CBT and DBT. Um, oh, and I know that. Do you want to say what those are? Yeah, yeah, sure. Cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy, and. Um, Which are considered two suicide specific treatments. Right, but they're also like core foundations of psychotherapy, and so, um, you know, every therapist is getting trained in CBT when they begin. I think the question I have is sort of like, how are we gonna? How are we helping people to? Build on that because I think this speaks to to um, doctor. I know you're. I think think you is the mom right now, even though you're the doctor. I'm the mom. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm thinking. But you're still. You know, what you were saying about how, you know, people aren't kept up to date. I think everyone gets these some of these things in their training foundation, but how can we support providers in taking it to taking it to a new level based on what we've learned? And so where I'm going with this is. I'm curious, like I know we can do trauma-informed anything, like we can do trauma-informed CBT or trauma-informed DBT, um, and at least in my experience, like almost every person, including myself, who's dealt with, who I've encountered, who's dealt with suicide, it's connected to some kind of trauma or some kind of traumatic experience, um, even if it's like societal trauma. Um, I'm wondering, like, where you know where trauma informed treatment comes into into this and and um, maybe if you could just say more about that and also are there other therapies that you're looking at like EMDR or or ACT or which is attached I'm not trained in that one so forgive me it's like an attachment commitment therapy or like EMDR means eye movement desensitization and reprocessing um, or other trauma informed therapies. So I'm going to answer in two words, okay. suicide specific. So CBT actually put out a whole augmentation because the cognitive behavior therapy, which is considered an effective therapy, needs to be suicide specific. So the practitioner who you're getting a referral for CBT treatment, you need to know that this person has been identified for suicidality. That has to occur at a screening. And then an assessment of how far they've gone with this. Do they have a plan? Have they identified a means? How long have they thought of it? All of that has to inform how you use CBT, and it needs to be suicidality specific. Or otherwise, we miss it. So um, can, can so you say more about what that training would look like for well, and, and also, how can we help with that? Like, is there a way the state can right. fund it or provide so, it? So, CALM is a two-hour online free training, the Counseling Access to Lethal Means. Two hours online. We have uh, clinicians in our state have uh, identified CAMS, the Collaborative Assessment for the Management of Suicide, as an assessment and a treatment. And uh, Department of Mental Health has been funding some CAMS training in three pilot uh, designated agencies. We've trained about 135, 40 uh, clinicians. So it's just got to be made available 
clinicians are motivated to do this work. You know, this this is it's yeah, it is hard hard to deal with a patient and not know the appropriate interface or tools to use. So we need to clarify the suicide specific nature of treatment and then we need to make the training available. And we would like to do that, but we need more dollars. It's a little expensive sometimes depending on what you're using. And that would go for the other treatments that you mentioned. EMDR is a generally effective therapeutic tool for dealing with trauma. However, um, if somebody isn't dealing with the cause of their suicidality, you know, the treatment can go round and round just like talk-based therapy can. You know, we, we have to really know how we're gearing for what purposes. Does that help? Well, it's, uh, some of what you said was helpful, like letting us know that. I don't. I mean, it was all helpful, but some of it was especially <laughs> helpful, like yeah. like what you said about how the state has to be pilot projects, because um, that sounds like we're we're exploring exactly. ways to to disseminate these these practices. And Tom is yeah. doing the evaluation on those workforce development initiatives. Yeah. So just two quick thoughts. One is that the um, the existing pilot is really aimed at employees of the designated agencies, and isn't really touching the hundreds and hundreds of providers who are out in the community. Um, so that's one thought, like a huge opportunity for expansion. Yeah. Another thought is that there's at least one or two states, I think Oregon is one of them, that has mandated that continuing education for um, psychological providers includes suicide prevention. So you can actually mandate that, and it, it leads to a change, like mandatory change, in providers' behaviors and preparation. David had a question. Now. Yeah, and it's, it's, I think it's essentially been answered by the answers that you all just gave, but it was whether the testimony that we heard about the lack of training and competency uh, is shared across the wider provider population in the state, and whether uh, there is possibly, whether there's a legislative solution in mandating more training and, and <laughs> You mentioned Oregon, so there that suggests many, maybe there is. Several, uh, there are three states, actually, that, that have passed uh, zero suicide legislation. Um, we just got the links from those from our partners at American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. and uh, I haven't looked closely at them. I did forward them to you, Ann, about a week ago. Um, we could look at that. I think we're trying right now to engage healthcare because we've got the all-payer outcome measures and they have big motivation to do this along with the swelling of concern of healthcare providers along the way. Um, so I think that has been our strategy and to work with the systems that deliver medical education to, to raise awareness but get a commitment. Uh, but it needs to be a formal commitment, and there needs to be explicit leadership commitment. Uh, the real issue is getting health care to fund the workforce development, or um, I say that rather naively, to figure out the funding mechanisms behind, because it does take some cost to organize, facilitate, offer. And also, we know that training is not effective when it's a one-shot deal that you know, training needs to be embedded in uh, a series of hours that are contact, but then followed up with uh, consult calls and coaching um, and ongoing systems management. Can I add to that? I, I think uh, Please. I should, my view is that we have work to do as, as a coalition and as interested parties to actually figure out where the legislative uh, piece can be helpful. I don't think we. I don't think we've done the homework to really um, uh, figure out what's worked in other states. What are the right laws? What are the wrong laws? You know, I don't think we're there yet. So I, I'm hoping that this is an ongoing conversation. Maybe in a year or two, we'll have better suggestions. But I don't think we have them right now. And and actually, it's a national dialogue. Too. Yeah. And I, I would. Can I just, I'd like to say a couple things and then a couple comments uh, from my own experience of working with this. As I think everyone knows, I worked as a psychotherapist and uh, worked in community mental health for 20 some years in Addison County um, and, and, and have been part of the coalition at times in the past. And this is, a, this is an issue I'm deeply passionate about, uh, in part because, um, again, as m most people know, uh, I've been committed to changing societal 
points of view around LGBTQ people, uh, particularly youth, and it's incredibly painful after probably 40 years of working to make change and having made some very significant changes in this state of Vermont to still be losing uh, young people, queer, LGBTQ young people uh, to suicide. Uh, for me, it's, 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 it's just personally and professionally very painful. Um, but I wanna, I wanna make two points. One is that um, having, having, providing people with a list of questions isn't sufficient. Uh, I can testify to the fact of people that I know being in a primary care physician's office where there was a list of all the questions to, 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 check, to ask about and knowing that the person was feeling suicidal and knowing that they skipped over all the questions that had anything to do with that so that by the time the person left the office, they were not asked the question. And they, many people, I'm, I'm gonna take the risk of being a, a witness here, but many people present like they're functioning very well at the point where they're actually very high risk of suicide. It is very and, easy to hide. It is very easy to hide. And uh, many of us know that because we've done it, frankly. And so you cannot just count on your personal observation and you think your clinical skills are the greatest. You cannot, with if you don't actually engage in asking questions in a way that you can get the answers, you will miss what's really going on. Second point I'd like to make, um, coming out of my work with LGBTQ youth, queer youth, as they many times prefer to be called these days, I was working uh, a young a girl, young woman, who had made had three psychiatric hospitalizations in Vermont, in the state of Vermont, for having made suicide attempts. And in each of the psychiatric hospitalizations, she was never asked or felt able to reveal anything about her conflict around sexual orientation. And it was not until she was in a second outpatient setting did someone finally mention to her outright Vermont, which was established in 1989 to help LGBTQ youth and to offer prevention services across the state. And what she said to me was, outright Vermont saved my life. And what I was listening is I was hearing her story. I was appalled. I was absolutely appalled that someone could have been admitted three times in Vermont to psychiatric inpatient care and never, from her point of view, never have someone ask or have her feel safe enough to raise that issue. So we must, and when we look at the data, and the data is absolutely the YRBS data, LGBTQ youth are some of the highest risk youth in Vermont, as well as youth of color. We must not just focus on issues of suicide. We must focus on the issues that are the underlying causes of why do so many, why should an LGBTQ youth feel that badly about themselves that they think the only solution is to end their life? And we must confront that amongst ourselves. These are the number kind of underlying issues that we that are harder for us to confront at times because, because societal points of view, sometimes religious, sometimes personal family, uh, create the environment in which that youth is feeling completely hopeless and they see no way out except to end their life. And so sometimes our interventions our societal interventions as well, in terms of saying we must not allow this to continue anymore, it is actually a matter of life and death. Uh, so, maybe a final comment, and then we're going to take I a break. I guess the final comment on that, and thank you so much for you know bringing our attention to that, um, Representative Lippert, um, is that today we're talking about health care, which is goal number seven of eleven in the Vermont Suicide Prevention Platform, which is a public health model with sociological, um, e ecological um, objectives built for different populations across different systems. Uh, and, you know, 
those other things are not being spoken about directly today, but absolutely, suicide is a complex societal issue, and we need to address it in a very multi-pronged public health approach. Today is the healthcare discussion, but other years and at other times and in other venues, we have the larger discussion. So uh, I will like to end on that note. Good. Thank you. Okay, let's take a break until a quarter after, and then we'll be back here. The, I mean, there are two other witnesses who are going to give us some updates. Okay. Really, again, to those who were witnesses this morning, thank you uh, for your part in that. And it's hard to stop a lot of conversation that I know is an important conversation going on, but I. I would like to uh, turn our attention to hearing um, from two other folks who are going to give us more of an update around some prevention efforts in the state. And uh, first, we'll turn to Tracy Dolan from the Department of Health, and uh, and then to Allison. We're going to tag team somebody else. Oh, that's fine. So, so off today. if you could just sure, move yeah. closer to the mic, both of you, okay. that'd be great. And then maybe just in starting, if you each identify yourself for the record, and then I'll leave it to you to proceed. I'm going to suggest we hold questions till we've heard from both of you, and then we'll engage in questions. And depending on where things go, we might want to engage in questions for some of our witnesses from this morning as well. For the record, Allison Crump. I'm a senior policy advisor for the Department of Mental Health. Um, I came on about a year ago, and in my previous life was a mental health crisis clinician. So I was the one in the EDs assessing for suicidality um, during a very tight time in the EDs. So um, it's a passion of mine, always has been. Um, and now I oversee the Grant Center for Health and Learning. Um, and so that's one of the first things I wanted to talk about today. Yeah, let Tracy introduce yourself. Yeah. I'm Tracy record. Dolan, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health. Thank Welcome you. to you both. Thank you. So I know you've heard a lot today that this is a major issue. So I think the goal for us today is to let you know um, what is going on right now um, in, in suicide prevention in the states, um, and then identify what are the gaps, um, and also where we see things headed. Um, so, um, the first thing to talk about is the Department of Mental Health supports uh, the Vermont Suicide Prevention Coalition. So those are the folks that you met with, I think, just prior to us coming in. Um, so you know a lot about that, and the group is really multifaceted, they're well established, um, and we really support their work, and part of the th things that we're using this group for are to use data that we have to then inform what that group uh, works on. And so for instance, we wanted to highlight that at our last quarterly um, meeting, there was a panel discussion for specific target populations. Those are populations that the data has um, stated really needs, that's at higher risk and needs attention. So we had panelists uh, to speak to LGBTQ um, youth and adults, new Americans, individuals with mental illness, including survivors, and older Vermonters. And so uh, this group is a major resource for the work going on in Vermont. <coughs> and then in terms of the Agency of Human Services, uh, we have a need to develop leadership on this issue, and we are doing that at AHS through this Suicide Prevention Leadership Group. So myself and Tracy Dolan share this group, and we have a few goals stated for this coming year. One of them was today. I'm working towards um, presenting the legislative report for Act 34, but also setting some interagency leadership on implementing the Zero Suicide Platform. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is um, in a few minutes. We also provide oversight and direction for the data surveillance group. Probably all know that Getting standardized data is really difficult. Um, people who do that in their line of work often get requests from all sorts of people all the time. And so we're working really hard across agencies to create some standardized ways to get really um, clear data um, that we're all going to work on together. And then one of the things that came up in our group as we were talking is, hey, how about our own staff? You know, we have a very large uh, group of people who work at the Agency of Human Services. What would they do if someone came up to them, one of their colleagues came up and said that they were feeling suicidal? So starting with our, within our own house was a priority for this year, um, and making sure that we've got a strong policy and people know what to do and how to seek help within AHS. And then the last piece is providing recommendations for future direction of policy and practice. So 
taking what we know and figuring out where to go from there. I'm just going to jump in. The other um, goal also related to Act 34. I, I believe um, this time next year we are due to provide um, you with a plan moving forward for um, suicide prevention in the state. And so this group this year will be developing those recommendations. Um, also related to this group, we are pursuing uh, a new grant that's uh, open now, and we're working on that um, from SAMHSA. Um, not every state will get it, so it's competitive, but um, if we get it, it's up to 750000 a year, I think, for five years, um, which is meant to be focused on youth suicide prevention. Uh, and so this group will also help inform that effort over the next uh, four to six weeks. So now we're moving on to, yeah, all right, to the data. I just wanted to speak a little bit about the data sources that we use um, when we look at suicide deaths. And I just want to acknowledge first, I wasn't in the room earlier, but um, uh, you know, a lot of us in the room have either lost someone through suicide or um, know someone um, close to us. And so I understand that there's a human being behind every one of these numbers. So we will be talking numbers and percentages, and that can feel sometimes pretty cold when we look at trends, but we recognize there's a human being behind each number. Um, we, uh, we will be applying this year for another five-year grant to continue our national violent death reporting system. Um, we also have data through Vital Statistics, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. We also have data on suicide risk factors through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, and hospital discharge data. So we do have some really good data sources both on the actual deaths and on the behaviors. I'm just going to speak to a few of those so you can understand what they're about the National Violent Death Reporting System. We entered into a partnership with Maine on a CDC grant to examine factors associated with suicide using the NVDRS. Uh, it collects data on violent deaths, including suicides. The three major data sources are death certificates, our medical examiner reports, and law enforcement reports. And the information uh, collected includes circumstances related to suicide deaths, <coughs> like depression, major life stresses, relationship or financial problems. So it does give us a more rich data than we get from our other sources. Um, looking at trends over the past 10 years, you can see here from 2008 through 2017. Um, in 2016, the US suicide rate was 13.5 per 100,000. Um, in Vermont, suicide is the eighth leading cause of death. And uh, in the US, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. So you can see here that our rate in 2016, as an example, was 17.3, so higher than the um, US uh, average rate. So that's just looking at it over, uh, over a period. We're going to break it down a little bit. Somebody has a funny view. Yes? I was whispering at the chair if we're saving questions for the end. I didn't mean to. I, I was think, trying to be discreet. I think we will. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and some end, of this, because we're going to pull it apart a little bit, yeah. it might get yeah. answered later. And if it doesn't, yeah, yeah please note it for sure. sure. And if we can't get you a question unanswered right away, we'll come back and to I it. I think some of us were presented with some data from earlier this morning and just trying to match the data to okay. see how it OK. Separate. And where there's a mismatch, we might have to get back to you. OK. Um, males and females, you can see that um, males have a much uh, higher rate of suicide in almost all the age groups other than uh, among young people. Um, Self-harm, however, um, works in the other direction. Females generally um, show more self-harm uh, than males. Um, and self-harm decreases with age. Can you say uh, what self-harm self may not mean something to folks who are it can include cutting, as an example. Do we have other things that fall in the self-harm category? Burning. Um, there are, I mean, there's different trends sometimes with teenagers, but with, um, poking with needles, things like that. Some people may not understand that that happens, but it does. Yeah, it really does. Creating self-pain to address pain. Yes. yes. Right. I'm going to cruise through these a little bit quickly, but hopefully you'll, you'll grasp. So suicide deaths in Vermont, 2015 through 2016, some numbers here. 98% of those deaths were white, non-Hispanic. That's a census category. Um, the average age was 49.5. 42% um, of those who um, died by suicide were never married. 48% had a diagnosis of depression. 32% had been receiving mental health treatment. 
and 14% had evidence of recent release from an institution. I'll have to get back to you on what we mean by institution there. I don't know if that would include corrections. I think it's usually psychiatric hospitalization. Psychiatric hospitalization. Okay. <coughs> All right. So risk factors and target populations. You might read information about um, who's most at risk in the United States, but that does vary from state to state. And so when we first looked at uh, the most at risk populations in the US, it didn't exactly line up, so we looked more closely at our data. Our risk factors are depression diagnosis, history of suicide attempt, physical health problem, the age range of 15 to 25 and then 60 and over, and veteran status. Our target populations in Vermont are teens and young adults, older adults, LGBTQ, new Americans, persons of color, and veterans. And we're going to break down for you a little bit some of those target groups and groups who've been identified as higher risk factors. Um, I so can't help but just say, when, if you look at the target groups and then you think about someone who fits into multiples yes. of the target groups, what that must be. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just yeah. looking at that going. Yep, no, that's an incredibly important point. Uh, what we know about um, folks in Vermont who have died by depression, or I'm sorry, with depression who have died by suicide, um, they are two times more likely to have previous attempts. They're also six times more likely to have received mental health treatment, um, which I think is interesting. I think some of you may know um, screening for depression has increased in Vermont. Uh, PHQ-9 is a common screening tool used. Um, and so it's, it's a good indication that people are getting to treatment if they have depression. Um, whether or not they're then being screened for suicidality or treated for that is another issue. Um, and then one in four adolescents reported feeling sad or hopeless um, with our youth risk behavior survey. I think it's just a staggering issue. And if you look at that closely, girls are up to 35% and our LGBTQ Q youth are 58% more likely to have expressed feeling sad or hopeless. So that's some statistics about our uh, population with depression. Um, we broke things out into age groups. And for the same group of youth who filled out the Youth Risk, risk Behavior Survey, 11% um, reported that they made a suicide plan in the last year. That number goes up again for girls and goes up again uh, for LGBTQ youth. And then our older population have a lower rate of depression diagnosis. They have a higher rate of disability. But it's this group, older men 65 and up, who have the highest rate of suicide. <clears throat> One of the things we're looking at is why that may be. Um, do they actually not have a diagnosis of clinical depression? Um, maybe it's they're facing a um, health condition or financial stressors, or is it a help-seeking behavior issue? Um, but one thing to note is that older adults who took their lives were more likely to have used a firearm, which we know is a more lethal means which could increase the rate of death. And then those with a history of suicide attempts. So they are more likely um, to have expressed suicidal thoughts in the past, more likely to have a diagnosis of depression. And then in Vermont, it is notable that there was over 1,000 ED visits and hospitalizations for self-harm. Um, and that's probably underreported. Uh, we don't have a good way to code self-harm at emergency departments. Sometimes it's just multiple complaints or lacerations. You may not know that. So that's just what we know of. Um, and so we do know that um, adolescents 15 to 24 are more likely um, to self-harm. We also know they're more likely to attempt multiple times um, before there's any death by suicide, which is good because it gives us more of a chance to intervene. Okay. Sure. So among those who have physical health problems, those who died by suicide and who had a physical health problem are more likely to have been a veteran, older than 45 years of age, four times more likely in this case, less likely to have reported problems with an intimate partner. Um, among Vermont adults, 62% have at least one chronic disease of those who have uh, died by suicide and 25% live with a disability. So like you mentioned, we have people obviously in multiple categories, which increases our risk. Um, those more likely to have a disability, um, 65 and older, lower education, lower income. Is this relative to 
other people who died by suicide are relative to the population as a whole? It's relative to our Vermont data. Yes, to other people who have died by suicide. Yeah. Yeah. So among veterans, those who died by suicide and were a veteran were more likely to have been older than 60, used a firearm, and have physical health problems. And males are more likely among veterans, um, ages 18 to 34, and that's 65 and older. Veterans use the firearms to take their own lives. Females, 100% um, versus 27% non-veterans. Males, 80% versus 59% non-veterans. So this is just telling us that veterans are much more likely to use a firearm. And we do know that access to lethal means increases suicide risk um, across age groups. <coughs> So new Americans, persons of color, and LGBTQ. Um, these three groups have the least quantitative data about suicide available. So we're asking new questions on BRFSS to gain insight. Um, and we hope to have better data available in uh, 2019. So LGBTQ adults are nearly twice as likely to be diagnosed with depressive disorder. Adolescents are more likely to feel sad or hopeless um, or to have made a suicide plan or attempt in the past year versus adolescents who are not LGBTQ. Um, adolescents of color are more likely to feel sad or hopeless or have made a suicide plan or attempt in the past year as well. Um, and uh, among adults of color, we're not seeing a difference in diagnosis of depression, but certainly among adolescents, we can see uh, stark differences. Um, we don't have specific information on new Americans or refugees. However, foreign-born Vermonters have a similar suicide rate as U.S. foreign Vermonters. So what do we do about it? Uh, we want to highlight that um, zero suicide is a framework that we are well versed in and it is working in other states. And so we are working to adopt that framework throughout Vermont. Um, and the pillars of that include leading. So we've talked a few, about a few of those initiatives. The coalition is an example of leading. AHS suicide prevention group is another. Training, uh, that includes not just having trained workforce um, within clinicians, but also training community members, training um, schools, training primary care to have that further out ability to identify and refer. Um, and that includes, um, that for identification and assessing, we're looking at universal screening. We screen in pockets, we screen uh, where it's obvious, we don't screen everywhere. Um, and so that's, that's another piece. And a fourth piece is engagement, and um, I, I would argue we're really struggling there in Vermont, um, given that only 32% of those who died by suicide have been receiving mental health treatment. We're not necessarily um, getting people in the doors um, and getting them the help that they need um, at the time that they need it. To treat, we have three pilots in Vermont um, that are su zero suicide pilots, and they are trained in an evidence-based practice called HAMS, which I will highlight uh, in a few minutes, it's Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality. Those three pilots are in uh, at the Howard Center in Chittenden County, um, at the Moyle, and then also up at NCSS for Franklin and Grand Isle. So three pilots, we could do better, um, but we know that um, treating and evidence-based practice is extremely important. And then transitions. So this is also a gap, it's always a problem in healthcare, is getting people in between providers Maybe you got them what they needed, but then the follow-up care falls off the map. Um, and so working through those transitions is extremely important. And the last pillar for zero suicide is improve. And that's using data, using everything we know and making informed decisions based off that. So examples of that are um, the AHS um, Suicide Leadership Group uses the data from our data surveillance group to inform practice. We're also assessing all of our zero suicide pilots to see how are they doing, is it working, and we're going to show you some of that data in a few minutes. In terms of investment, um, there's the NDVRS grant that Tracy spoke of earlier that supports gathering this data. The Department of Mental Health invests $191,000-ish to the Center for Health and Learning, and with that they do a lot. Um, they do basically um, all the things that we've mentioned earlier, all of the training out in the communities, zero suicide training, the CAMS training, and the work with the schools for prevention. Um, and so uh, VDH also <coughs> provides some upstream investments that go to Center for Health and Learning, and that's for our UMatter trainings in schools. 
So it's really trying to broaden gatekeeper training to help people know how to identify those in need. There was a project a few years ago up at NMC that looked at coding um, and coding people who come into the ED. So that's data that's being analyzed now. It's not an ongoing project. It was a one time. And then Blueprint. They had a recent investment in 2018, $1,500 to get them started to work. They worked with one PCP office and a designated agency to try to work on um, referrals. And so we see SASH and Blueprint um, and ESPINs as really good partners in this project because they, uh, their bread and butter is screening and referral and doing that very well. So this is just giving you an idea of who those partners are and some of the things that have come out of that. Um, and so in terms of means restriction, the Queechee Bridge Mitigation Project is a great example. In fact, I just heard a story of a, a state trooper who was passing by and someone was on the bridge um, attempting to climb the fence and they were struggling to do that and they did have time to pull them down. And that's just the perfect example of what time can buy you when someone's uh, experiencing a heightened challenge in their life. A little bit about You Matter. This is where we're doing our gatekeeper and upstream prevention. So You Matter has a series of trainings in schools and communities, and it provides an asset-based approach to suicide prevention. So it's a nationally recognized best practice that happens in our schools in Vermont. And there's this emphasis on creating prevention-prepared community. So it's people feeling comfortable and confident asking uh, their friends how they're doing. Um, it's, it's training trainers so that they can keep and sustain um, that knowledge. And then it builds connections between schools and families and support services. So at every You Matter training, you're inundated with what are your resources, who would you call, what would you do in this scenario, to really try to bolster um, at a community level uh, what people's resources are and how they would uh, act when a crisis occurs. And that's jointly funded by the Department of Mental Health and BDH. And just to show you the impact of You Matter, um, this is some pre and post data that we've gathered from that training. And so for the training of trainers, we're really focusing on clinicians about how to treat. But then what I find really interesting is this youth and young adults um, <coughs> at the bottom of how they describe their ability to respond um, to their own peers when they're uh, in a moment of crisis. And I think this last piece where you see 64% of youth understanding the difference between fixed and growth mindset, and then at the end, 98% do. This I would just personally like to highlight because growth mindset is when you see a failure as a setback, but one that you can get past. Um, it's one where it teaches you that if you develop skills and grow, you will be able to overcome that. Where some youth really struggle with that ability, and if they face a setback, it can become permanent for them. They consider it part of their makeup that I am a failure, and therefore nothing will get better. And it's that type of mindset that can really lead to lack to more hopelessness, you know, lack of optimism. You can't see your future beyond the trees, and so when when you have that type of fixed mindset, it's much more difficult for you to face challenges in your life. And so more programs like this that can help build those skills are really important. In terms of the investment dollars and what they're going to, this is the makeup of um, those events. And so you'll see there's a gate, great deal of the gatekeeper training. And gatekeeper training is when I say you matter, that's a gatekeeper training. That's going um, to the community level. Mental Health First Aid is another community level um, effort. So I don't know if you've heard of Mental Health First Aid. It's been around a long time. But I'm a Mental Health First Aid trainer, and I believe in it. Um, but it's for community members um, helping your neighbor that sort of thing. And then we have our CAMS and COM trainings. So CAMS training is the specific for clinicians to treat suicidality. COM is counseling about um, access to lethal means. So that's really teaching anybody, especially providers of any kind, how to talk to somebody about their access to lethal means in a non-judgmental way, in a way that's just informative, that's bringing the conversation to the forefront. This is just some data that we've collected about how it's going with this zero suicide implementation and these CAMS trainings. And CAMS, again, is this uh, assessment and management of suicidality. 
And we're seeing that people who are trained in CAMS are having a significantly increased uh, confidence in their ability to assess patients for suicidality and to treat patients who have expressed suicidality. And so, so far we feel that this has been a very successful pilot, but again, it's only in three regions of Vermont. We wanted to highlight that we do have a crisis text line gotten a lot of hits over the past we started it in November 2016 there's over 2,000 conversations with over 1,000 texters um, and so the main reasons we have for people texting into the text line are relationship issues um, followed by other stressors um, such as financial and legal but that's a high percentage 28.4 percent including the topic of suicide because this is a crisis line for a variety of crises and that really just shows you how suicide can be connected to such a variety of you know, issues that people are facing. Mm -hmm. Is this a, it's a Vermont line? So the, the crisis text line is a national effort, but our, we are partnering with them for a Vermont specific text line. So you text VT to this line and it identifies you as a Vermonter. And we have all our data that's Vermont specific on who's reaching the text You get line. the national data from the National Center for Vermont. We get the Vermont data. So and where do you, how do you know about this? this how do you know, how does anyone know what the tax number is to tax? So we work on promoting that at every event we have. So we don't, uh, we don't know about it here. Okay. Yeah, no, it's not necessarily widespread. That's something we gotta continue to work on. We don't I mean, have a. I know of it, but I wouldn't know how to text it if I had to. Yeah, we don't have a, a dedicated budget for the promotion of it, although we have tried to mix it in, but that's something to That's a really good on. point. We yeah. don't have a communications team, but it's really good for me to hear that. Um, I mean, how, how many people in the room know the text number to call? The text. I do, okay. but I'm about to broadcast it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah, right. Okay. And, uh, quick, quick question here. I, I don't see um, the similar data or responses on, do you also track the Vermont support line? We don't have the data on that, no. Okay. No, but I would like to. Yeah, okay, they produce it. Yeah, great thing to okay. write that. Yeah, yeah. it'd be good to. Okay. Thank you. So I, I, we're, I know people are itching to ask questions, yeah. so let's just get a sense of. Yeah, slide, which is just testimonials about how well CCR's do site work. Great, let's open up to question. Woody has a question, and Brian Smith has a question. Brian, Gina has a question. So go for it. A couple of questions. Um, you focus on veterans, um, mainly those that are 60 years of, old, of age, but um, in, in recent times now, uh, the focus is not just on older veterans, it's on younger veterans, particularly combat veterans that have come back from a uh, wartime environment. Um, and their numbers are increasing, not just for males, but also for females. So I'm just pointing that out. Also, I don't see anything on uh, first responders, uh, whether they're listed in, in uh, your statistics. And then um, finally, I don't think anyone has mentioned, what does one do when um, they recognize that somebody is in, uh, in crisis? What what should I do to help my friend? Yes, so I can speak to that. Um, in fact, it's not on this slide, but we have a very handy list of resources that includes veteran specific, because we do know that uh, veterans often uh, are more likely to seek help when it's from people within their own culture. Um, and so uh, the National Lifeline has Vermont, has a veteran specific line, so you press one and you're connected to that. Uh, to that specialty. Um, so there's a national lifeline you can call, there's a crisis text line that you can use, and then there's a crisis center in each uh, county that has 24-7 coverage. But really, what you can do if somebody comes up to you and expresses any sort of suicidal thoughts is listen and stay with them until you connect them with somebody who uh, can provide help. And so we provide little wallet cards whenever we do new matter trainings that has all of the resources and phone numbers. Great. And you had a question then, I think. Just, do you also work 
uh, with, are you part of the, the Vermont Gun Shop project? So in our previous grant, that was one of the deliverables. It is not in this year's grant. Um, I was approached recently to restart that. Uh, and it was mentioned earlier in the presentation. Does, does everyone know what that is? No? Okay, well, why don't someone, someone should say something about it? That's something that's initiated a few years back. Just a few years ago. Yeah, I can just briefly, it was working with um, gun shop owners uh, to provide them more education and resources um, for those who might be coming into their shops um, who are also in crisis and to be able to provide that kind of support also to um, promote the, uh, the suicide call line for that population as well. Am I catching most of it? And, and, and yeah, it was a part. It was a partnership with the Gun uh, Federation yep. of uh, uh, Vermont and the Sportsman's Association, two major gun owning communities, um, to move the discussion upstream and to gauge, give them the resources, as Tracy said, uh, in their gun shops. And, and including among themselves as gun owners and friends, sportsmen. Yes. How to, that's what Woody's question reminded me. And Why frankly, don't you talk to a friend? Quite frankly, it collapsed about. a bit last year with all of the you know discussion about gun legislation, um, and we would like very much to continue to do that work and continue to focus on guns as a lethal means. So. Yeah, the, um, the the one of the important pieces of it was really getting. A connection to a population that we might not normally get a connection to through this work so that was good um, I think we learned about it from New Hampshire um, there wasn't an evidence base that necessarily supported it as a as an evidence-based practice however that relationship is really important and a lot, a lot more can be done with that relationship and certainly if there is an evidence base that says when you give people the right kind of information at the right time that can be helpful and so, so I'm not sure if I got some losses. It was Brian Smith and Brian Chin. Okay, good. Thank you. Appreciate your help. I want to ask you, uh, if someone gets treated uh, for potential suicide, you know, they go to the hospital and they've been treated there and they have medical records stating that there was a suicide attempt on their own life. If they go down the road and try to buy a gun, background checks won't show that medical history, will it? No. They should, shouldn't they? One would think that could be very helpful. It would certainly yes. be helpful. Uh, that leads me to a different question. The first question I was going to ask you is, uh, Sissy, do, do you believe that self-harm is a suicide attempt? I don't think it's necessarily considered that way. No, it's definitely there is a distinction, and it is usually to feel physical pain because it helps handle emotional pain. And when you stub your toe, you forget about the rest of your worries for the day. Um, there, it's a similar uh, thing, but it is not. Most of the time, there are some times where somebody might have self-harmed with the hope that maybe, but the majority of the time, um, youth and adults express that that is not the intention. Uh, just back to your first question, I just do want to highlight the importance, of course, of people's health records being private. And so as, much as, as much as it would be helpful to be able to take that into account, one also recognizes that people's health information is private. And so for vendors to be able to access people's health records could be, of course, it might also result in people not willing to seek help. I would yes. Say. Right. Yeah. Because if they know that's going to down the line, yeah. maybe be on a list, prevent them from being a sportsman. Or, or on the other hand, if they knew that they were going to have a background check and their medical history was there, they might not go in and buy a gun. Well, I guess it's two sides. It's, the yeah, point. there's been a, it, sure. it is it is a big discussion. It's a good question because it. it I would I wouldn't want my medical history revealed by to anybody. Yeah. But if it meant uh, being preventable, preventing being able to buy a gun. That might not be such a bad idea. You follow me? I hear you. I think I said that the right way. Yeah. 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 Uh, right. So I have just three three questions about some of the demographic stuff earlier on in the presentation. Um, when you are looking at, I'd have to go back to see the exact page. When you're talking about 
uh, high risk populations you mentioned, you know, LGBTQ, new Americans, individuals with mental illness, older Vermonters. Um, I'm wondering if the state of Vermont looks at Abenaki children or Abenaki adults. Does, do you, is, that, is that a question? Like when, when you're doing surveys, like do you give people a chance to identify? We have had some specific um, partnerships with the Abenaki community. Um, Jamal will probably speak very well to that. There's one going on. Sure. One of our uh, agencies, Northwest Counseling Support, has long been concerned about this. They want to work up in the Franklin County. So um, Dr. Tom Delaney, who presented earlier, took a look at the data with us, and we identified a disproportionate number of Abenaki results, although you would notice on that state countywide data that Grand Isle was at the bottom of the list. but it represented a disproportionate amount of suicide deaths in the Abenaki population. UVM Medical Center Community Investment Funds have funded a three-year project with the FQHC, Federally Qualified Health Center in Burlington, Northwest Counseling Support Service, and the Abenaki Family Advisory Council of Missisquoi County, um, and the Center for Health and Learning to build out a project. And it's brought us to our knees in terms of really understanding that our perception of healthcare systems may or may not um, meet the needs of the Abenakis and that if they do it's gonna it's gotta be informed by Abenaki. We're taking a community based participatory research approach so that uh, we don't do any interaction without um, everything being vetted through the Abenaki community and we've trained Abenakis to as community members to go out and collect qualitative interview uh, information to try and learn more about help seeking. Okay. Thank you. In terms of state surveillance systems, um, it gets challenging because the numbers are so small so that they don't reveal themselves in the way that they might if we were to significantly oversample in a particular uh, population. So the numbers are small so they don't reveal themselves as a standalone um, loop in the same way that uh, a more targeted project would allow for. I, I had two more demographic questions. Um, one of them, these should be simpler, I think. One, I'm just looking for the slide, but it said somewhere that there were, that suicide was the eighth leading cause of death. I don't know what page that was. Yeah. How many causes of death are listed? Like eight out of how many? Eight out of 10, eight out of 100, eight out of 1,000, like. You don't have to answer it right now, but that's, I wonder that, because whenever I see numbers, I always, I'm starting to think more of the context than the numbers. Um, and you know, so eighth out of what? I think you know the reason we list it as eighth year is just to compare it uh, to the tenth leading cause in the U.S. So to just highlight yeah. that in Vermont, we have a, a problem that we deem more serious than the, the U.S. Um, based on our numbers. Okay, so and it's, the, it's a little more of a relative rather than the, the longer list. All right, so. and then the other question. I, I'm trying to be quick so other people have time. Um, suicide deaths in Vermont, 2015 to 2016. I think it's two down or something. There. Yeah. So uh, this, you know, this section on ma marriage or whatever you want to call it, um, 42 relationship status, like 42%, so 42 percent were never married, 25 percent married, 26 percent, 7 percent widowed. I'm curious how that compares to like how many people have never been married, how many people have been married, because seeing that by itself, I'm like, well, you can draw all kinds of conclusions. You like, can. This is you know, descriptive. Yeah. The way we present it here is purely yeah, descriptive, but be, so we'd have to... Yeah, it'd be interesting to see, though, like, how does that compare, like, to... That's all. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, there's all kinds of questions I'd love to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think maybe you were going to ask about the age-adjusted information that was on an earlier slide. So we know that Vermont has a has the second oldest population in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, it was gender and age? Uh, no, no. It was the graph that showed um, it showed age. It, it, it mentioned age adjusted figures on it. It was a line graph. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I guess I, I'm I'm just wondering that since, since we know that we have an older population. Overall, when you adjust for that, are we saying that consistently Vermont has a higher suicide rate? Or that, so we still would make that a statement. Okay. Back to the marriage, just real quickly. We do know that being married or being in a couple generally is more protective for every health outcome. So that Surprise. would be 
that would be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> even though we made this <laughs> Maybe my mom's right. <laughs> so I, I just want to comment. This is coming out of my own experience as well of the uh, working with LGBT community. Is that is that we identify we identify the those who well if you are in fact wrestling with your identity and it's not safe to identify, you will not collect that statistic about what's happening in for non-publicly non identifying LGBTQ people. And so I would just suggest that there is a whole nother cohort of Vermonters who are in that highest risk category, or very high risk category, and who are not reflected as being LGBTQ in other data because, in fact, the very issue for many people that's keeping them from being safely identifying in family or workplace or wherever uh, is part of the dynamic. And so we, we have to, it's just another, it's just another layer. Piece, layer. It's just another layer. Yeah. Well, th this is, uh, we're going to stop so, here. Uh, just oh, one, sorry, one more question. Yeah, please. Um, your physical health problem that you had the slide, um, those who died by suicide and had physical health issue. Yeah. I was just wondering about medically assisted suicide. Um, do you take that into, into consideration at all? I know it's a different category, obviously, but um, it's just the thought that I was thinking about uh, when I saw your slide. Yeah, in Vermont, our numbers are very um, low there. I don't know how low our numbers were for last year, but I don't know that it would impact this, these numbers in any significant way. Those, I don't think yes. those are yeah. counted. They're not 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 But, you know, we've discussed this a lot at the coalition level. And really, the coalition, which is composed of multiple organizations and perspectives, feels very strongly that, you know, that's an end of life conscious yes. decision. Our target target population are people who are feeling, you know, the, the risk factors, lonely, isolated, chronic pain, despondent, whatever it is. So we've really been able to separate it out and it's not included in the data at the medical examiner's office. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you and again thank you to those who were here for the whole morning and the early part of the morning. Thank you all. And I, just to say that I think we need to stop and think what is it, what role can we play? Uh, there may or not, may not be things to do right now. I'll just mention, as uh, Representative Donahue did, interestingly, everyone has testified how important SASH is, and we have uh, a budget proposal that would slash their money by half. So, um, Which we didn't know about because it's not our committee right. in theory, but yeah. obviously there's overlap with our yeah, committee. But, the, but so there are places where we would clearly. Uh, think about interacting, and we will look forward to other initiatives in the future. So, thank you. Thank you.